Hello everyone, welcome back to another engineering statics lecture video. In this lecture video, we're going to be covering one of the last topics that we have in this video series, which is center of gravity and mass. Now, before we begin, I always want to say, I hope that everyone's doing well. At this point, you probably had a midterm or maybe a couple midterms, so you guys are probably a little beaten up. So again, I hope that you guys are doing well. All right, so again, this video is going to focus on center of gravity and mass. Now, when it comes to this, these words, center of gravity and mass, it's something that you guys have probably heard before. It's something that you guys have actually dealt with indirectly in this class. Because an example or an application of the center of gravity is the self-weight of a body. A lot of the problems that you've had so far actually consider the self-weight of the structure. I would always get a lot of messages on Discord saying, Clayton, I can't solve this problem. I keep getting it wrong. My equilibrium doesn't work. Well, typically it's because the student forgot to account for the self-weight of the actual structure. Now, a lot of students actually come to me and say, well, Clayton, who cares? It's just self-weight. It's not that much when you actually consider the loads placed on a structure. I get that a lot in the third and fourth year classes. Completely untrue. The self-weight of a structure is actually very prominent. And if you guys ever go lift concrete, or especially if you lift steel, you'll see that that's heavy. <laughs> it's really heavy. It's not that fun to lift. So the self-weight actually becomes quite a large force when we design structures. Uh, funny enough, concrete structures, for instance, they will actually tend to crack under their own self-weight. So that's how much the self-weight force actually contributes to a structure. Now, why am I talking about self-weight? Well, when we did analysis of beams or trusses or whatever, and we want to consider the self-weight force, we always had to pick a location, say, where that self-weight force acts. Now, the location of where this self-weight force acts, that's actually going to be our center of gravity, which is the main concept of this video. So again, when we analyze a structure, it's very important to consider self-weight, which we often ignore, but realistically, please don't ignore. Uh, if you do that in a third year or fourth year class, I will dock you marks, I promise you, because it's very important. But the nice thing for us in this particular course is when we did consider self-weight, we always kind of said, well, it mainly acts at the center of a body. If we had a rectangular beam, we know that the self-weight force acts kind of right in the middle of that beam. If we were to have a circle, well, it's going to be the same thing. Our self-weight force acts right at the center of that circle. Now, the nice thing for us is that the idea that a self-weight force or the center of gravity is right in the center of our shape, this is always true for a symmetrical body with uniform density. So again, our beams are usually rectangular, which are symmetrical, we're good to go. And typically they always have a uniform density. If my beam is made of one particular material, let's say steel, it's going to have a nice uniform density. Now the question becomes, well, what happens if we have a non-uniform density or an unsymmetrical shape? And you guys are saying, okay, well, it sounds like it's going to be kind of bad, but we've actually already dealt with the first case, which is an unsymmetrical body. Remember that one of the earlier things that we dealt with was distributed loads. And we said kind of the, the mean load that they could give you was a triangular load, something that looks like this. And we said, okay, well, it's actually not too bad because this load can be summarized as the point load that acts at B over 3 or 2B over 3, depending on which side you're measuring from. Again, this goes back to the idea of finding this center of gravity. Now, the kind of the funny thing was is we never really got into the idea of why it was b over three it was something that i just kind of gave to you guys and said trust me which <laughs> i know is always the worst thing to say to students because none of them want to trust me but trust me this is where it acts the whole idea of this video as well as the next video is trying to say okay why does this act at this location because again this location here is actually known as the centroid so we're going to derive some equations that will help us solve for this location, no matter what shape we have or the density distribution within the shape. The center of gravity. To determine this center of gravity force, let's consider a system with three particles of different weight or mass located in a space relative to each other. So let's say that we have a kind of three-dimensional scenario where we have three shapes, or I guess three particles, and each one of these particles has a different mass. So we have W1, W2, W3. And they're all located in a space so we can define some dimensions. So one particular dimension that I'm going to put is going to be the distance from the y uh, z plane. So we have y squiggle 1, 
y squared will 2, y squared will 3. So it's just the distance from the plane to the center of our particle. Now the whole idea of what we're going to do is we are going to take this system where it's a bunch of different particles and we are going to reduce it to an equivalent force couple system. So this is one of the reasons why we talk about these equivalent force couple systems so that when it comes to centroids here, you guys know exactly what we're doing. And if you think about it, this is something we've actually already done. When it came to distributed loads, we had a lot of forces acting along our member and we reduced it to a single force. That's all we're doing right here. So we have our system on the left and we're trying to replace it with a system on the right where everything acts at a single point. So this red point here, that's where I want my force to act. The most trivial one when it comes to reducing to an equivalent force couple system is going to be the idea of the resultant force which I'm going to call WR. In this case, it would be a resultant weight, something like this. And we know that a resultant weight is just going to be the summation of all the weights of the particles. So W1 plus W2 plus W3. The question becomes is, okay, we know that if we were to move a particle around, it's going to create a moment. So what we need to do now is we need to figure out where to place this red particle so that it creates the same moment as the system we have on the left. So we're trying to find this location, which we call Y bar, something like this. And it's actually pretty easy to figure out. All we're going to do is we are going to analyze the resultant moment of the left system, which is going to be basically the summation of our weight times our moment arm, which is Y squiggle I. So we got W1, Y squiggle 1, plus W2, Y squiggle 2, etc., etc. And we are going to make it equivalent to the moment or of our resultant moment on the right. So on our right side, it's simple because we only have the one force. It's going to be WR, our resultant weight, times Y bar. Now what's nice is MR in the XY plane is the same on both sides. So we can actually kind of manipulate the formula a little bit to get the following. And then if we rearrange it, we can solve for this Y bar, which is going to be the summation of WI, Y school I, divided by the summation of WI. Now this is great because what this basically is, is the y coordinate of our center of gravity. So that's it. That's easy for center of gravity. If we want to find center of gravity, all we have to do is follow this nice easy formula where we basically take the weight of all of our particles or all of our shapes and we multiply it by the distance from some sort of point and then divide it by the summation of the weight. Now, it sounds a little crazy, but we're going to do some examples and you guys are going to say, oh, Clayton, you know what? It's not that bad. You weren't lying to me, at least not lying to you yet. <laughs> it gets bad a little bit later, as you guys will see. So if we were to determine the center of gravity and we were to repeat that exact same process that we did for the X and Z coordinates, we basically get the following three formulas. Again, we have three coordinates, X, Y, and Z, because the center of gravity is a point on our shape. But actually, kind of a fun fact, it doesn't actually have to be on our shape. There are some shapes where the center of gravity can be off of our shapes, but you probably won't see them too much in this course. If we were to look at the formulas, it's actually very nice. The only difference between formulas is that we go from XI squiggle to YI squiggle to ZI squiggle. Now you guys saying, Clayton, what the hell is that? Well, this is the distance from the planes to the center of our particle. Again, I'm going to do an example and it'll make lots of sense. Uh, WI, that's the weight of our particles. So if we look at this formula, it's, it's pretty simple. It only has two components. And you guys are saying, yeah, but those components look like ass. I don't know what they mean. So let's do a quick example. And after this, you guys will say, ah, Clayton, piece of cake. And the example is this. Let's say that we want to find our center of gravity for these two shapes that are combined together. So if we had just a rectangle, you guys will say, oh, Clayton, it's right in the center. But if we look at this shape here, it's actually a collection of two rectangles. So the question is, what is the center of gravity or the Y coordinates of the center of gravity for these two shapes when they're combined together to form kind of one mega T shape, something like that. So what we'll do is we'll give you the weight of both of the shapes. So WP, which is our purple shape, it has a weight of 25. And WB, which is the blue shape, has a weight of 10. Another thing that they'll typically give you is some dimensions. So we'll say that for the blue shape, it's 100 millimeters or feet or whatever you want high. And the purple shape is 30 millimeters feet or whatever high as well. Now, again, the question would be something like, okay, 
where is the y coordinate of the center of gravity for this specific shape? And if we look here, if we want that y coordinate, which we call y bar, we just go to the formula above. And again, it's pretty hard to look at this formula and know what each of the components mean. Wi, that's actually pretty simple. It's going to be Wp and Wb. What typically gets students is going to be that y squiggle. So we're going to cover that. So if we want to, we look at this and say, okay, in its original form, it's a summation, meaning that basically every time I have a different shape, I'm going to have to include it. If we were to look at our example here, it's two shapes. So we know that our summation basically has two terms. So if we look at the top, it's going to be wp times y squiggle p plus wb times y squiggle b. And on the bottom, it's wp plus wb. That part, if we were to look at this formula, it's not too bad because we know what wp and wb are. The only thing that's going to get students is what is that y squiggle? Well, all this is is the distance from the plane to the center of our particle. So in this case, if we are looking at y bar, that distance is going to be from the x, z plane, or in a 2D scenario, just the x axis, to the center. What's nice for us is we know that the center of a rectangle is just halfway up. So if I wanted the purple one, for instance, y squiggle is just going to be half that distance of our rectangle. Now, it starts to get a little bit more tricky when it comes to the purple one, because we know, again, it's going to be halfway up, but we're measuring from that plane the x, z plane, or I guess in 2D scenarios, it just is the x axis. So we know that y squiggle purple is going to be the entire distance of our blue shape plus one half of that purple shape. So if we were to look at the blue shape, it's just going to be 100 divided by two. And if we were to look at the purple shape, it's going to be 100 plus 30 divided by two, or basically 115. So that's the whole idea here, is all we're doing is we're measuring from the axis to the centroid of our shapes. Not too bad because everyone knows where the centroid of a square or a rectangle already is. So we can just substitute everything in and then we get that y bar is equal to 96.4. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, you said this, you said this was hard. Did you lie to me? Well, no. And the reason why is this. If we were to look at this shape and the formulas that we used, it was all dependent on knowing where y squiggle was. And we said, okay, well, for a rectangle, it's just halfway up, right? It's, it's not too bad at all. But what happens if our composite shape here is composed of smaller shapes that we don't know what y squiggle is? That's where things start to get hard. So yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.